welcome to Brain Fluence. I'm Roger Dooley. And today joining me is Neil Schaefer, and I'm going to let him introduce himself and explain who he is and what he does. Hey, Roger, and uh, hello, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. My name is Neil Schaefer. I am a digital marketing author, speaker, consultant. I teach uh, executives as part of the executive education program at a Rutgers Business School uh, in the United States, the Irish Management Institute in Ireland, and the University of Yavaskala in Finland. They have a program called the Avance Executive Education Program in Helsinki. And I am the recent author. I mentioned that I've, uh, I am the author. I've published a few books on digital and social media marketing. My latest book is called The Age of Influence, and it's really about hopefully redefining in some ways, this concept of digital influence and uh, how I believe marketers have in many ways, most recently, vis-a-vis -vis social media influence, I believe have been somewhat miseducated. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for businesses once they, uh, once they redefine uh, what digital influence is and the many different ways that they can collaborate with other social media users. So I thought uh, this would be a great, uh, you know, Roger and this podcast would be a great uh, arena to discuss those issues and hopefully help a lot of the people that are listening. Well, definitely. Our listeners are all about influence, and now they're coming at it from a little bit different standpoint. They're coming at it from the Robert Cialdini influence standpoint in many cases, uh, which is sort of a broader way of influencing the way people think. But at the same time, uh, Cialdini definitely uh, deals with the kind of influence that you write about, Neil. And I've been reading Age of Influence, and it's a great read, very practical, and a Thank lot you. of very useful advice that uh, any size brand or company can use. Uh, but uh, uh, even uh, Bob Cialdini talks about social proof and authority, both of which are different kinds of interpersonal influence. Social proof, in the case if you see a lot of people doing something, uh, then you may do that thing yourself. And authority, more if a person who should know about something recommends it, then you're likely to be persuaded because that person is an expert. And if that can even translate into celebrities. So if LeBron James recommends a particular brand of refrigerator, then that's still going to influence quite, quite a few people to check out that brand. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a fun read. And I think that we're really going to get some uh, interesting ideas for our audience. And I, one thing I like, Neil, is that you point out the history of influence marketing goes way back before the internet. And back about probably 300 plus years ago, uh, there was the Queen of England, who began letting her brand be used on things like Wedgwood earthenware. Uh, and so that was, and I would guess, I don't know if you've done that at all, but I would guess that you could probably go back to Roman times or even Egyptian times and find examples of how, uh, gee, this is the whatever that Caesar used or, you know, the Pharaohs preferred something. Uh, and uh, it's just a natural tendency for people to want to know what other people are doing and particularly people who they respect. Yeah, it very much is human nature. And, and you know, obviously Influence is the book that, uh, that really uh, dives deep into that and really is- And we, is, we did not set that up either, I'll, I'll add. Uh, that, that, was, <laughs> but that really is the framework. You, 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 came, you came prepared, Neil. Yes, yes. And you know, my approach um, is really more from the marketing practitioner. And I, you know, we talked about Mark Schaefer who wrote The Return, of, Return on Influence and he wrote that about a decade ago. Obviously, Influence was written a few decades ago. And my approach is really from the, the marketing perspective that obviously this book was written before the coronavirus pandemic, but with that pandemic, uh, marketers now understand they, they really need to be digital first in order to be where our customers are at and reach them. Um, my approach was looking at just this evolution of digital and more and more social media marketing and realizing that one big area where it just becomes more and more difficult for companies to compete in is this organic social media space. And, and really, I think the promise to all of us marketers when social media began was this viral word of mouth marketing that uh, would be easy to do. We have a Facebook page, we get lots of engagement and friends of fans see the content and and then it ties into everything that that's in influence and you know authority and social proof what have you and i remember back in the day i think smart water was one of these iconic brands that actually forwarded their domain to their facebook page because it was such a powerful <laughs> way of inciting when we don't do that anymore and there have been a few other trends that have really uh driven uh, you know the driven businesses to have less and less influence in social media and driven individual people, what we would call content creators, 
to have more and more influence to the point where if you were to ask younger people, you know, our generation, Roger, you know, baby boomers, Gen Xers, you know, I'll never forget after Top Gun came out, one of my best friends suddenly started riding a mo motorcycle with a black leather jacket and, and like the Tom Cruise look. Um, these days, the people that influence younger generations are not these traditional celebrities that we're used to seeing. Um, they're people on, on YouTube or maybe TikTok or Instagram that we've never even heard about. So that's really where the journey in writing the book began. But as I began writing and doing more research, I realized that it's not just for iconic consumer brands that the same principles can be leveraged for B2B brands, could be leveraged for nonprofits, even government organizations. Uh, and that's where it really uh, fascinated me and where I realized that there was sort of a disconnect between what the mass media and even what bloggers, when they talk about influencers, they're talking about these celebrities. Uh, and what I realized was that just being able to what I call leverage the other or being able to collaborate with other social media users is really I feel one of the best, and if not the only way to truly incite word of mouth marketing, how are you going to get other people to talk about your brand and social media or your business? It's really by collaborating with others and facilitating that. And that's really the heart of what the book is about. Yeah, I think one thing that has changed over the years is that, uh, as you say, anybody can be an influencer. You know, even a few years ago before the internet was huge, you really had to have some kind of a platform. You know, you, Michael Jordan could endorse uh, sneakers and that would be a very a credible influence. But uh, today, you know, you can be a 16 year old putting makeup on or something and have a million followers. And as you say, most of us haven't even heard of these people, but they have uh, their devoted audience. But I, I'm curious about trust because, I mean, to me, if I see uh, somebody that I follow on Instagram or Facebook or someplace, and they're recommending a particular product. And if they've got just 100 or 200 followers, then I figure, okay, they're probably recommending that, not because they are paid by the brand to do that, because brands don't pay people, um, in most cases, if they don't have much of an audience. Uh, but if I see somebody who's got a million followers, then, okay, I'm thinking that whatever they're doing is going to be colored by uh, money. And so how, how do you, is that the case? And how do you build trust with an audience, particularly if they know that you're getting paid by the very brands that you're talking about? Yeah, this is where the, the neuromarketing approach to this is, it becomes very valid. Uh, so I think that there are what I would call social media influencers, and then we have celebrities. So when Shaquille O'Neal, better known as Shaq, uh, does a commercial for Buick, we understand that he may have never owned a Buick, but he's getting paid to do that, right? It doesn't necessarily make us lose trust in Shaq or Buick. And we're exposed to this Buick automobile that even a tall basketball player can fit in. So there, there is human nature that says, in, in the same way with an influencer, uh, before they've become a celebrity, you know, Charlie is an example of a, now I think she recently turned 16 on TikTok, that came out of nowhere and she was already on Super Bowl TV commercials this past year. At that point, when you're in traditional media, you are a celebrity. You're no longer, you know, you're no longer a, a what I would call traditional social media influencer. So when we get below that, uh, people that have built communities based on creating content and offering information or engagement or entertainment around a subject, I think that today it is natural that these people will from time to time collaborate with companies and they will say this is sponsored by or thanks to this brand for allowing me the opportunity to do this. And I think that it is a tricky thing for influencers to do because at the end of the day, if their community stops engaging with them and doesn't listen to them anymore, they lose their influence. So they need to be careful that they're working with brands that are aligned with who they are and brands that are also aligned with the community and that a, any type of collaboration offers ideally a win-win-win, a win for the brand, a win for the influencer, and a win for the community. So you, you do have, uh, obviously, you know, influencers who, who don't do this well. Um, and I think those are the influencers that really lose a lot of this engagement. And what marketers and brands are getting smarter and smarter is that they're not just chasing after vanity metrics anymore. Well, some still are, but it's not a matter of how many likes something gets or how many comments. It's what actions, the true definition of influence is really 
you know, we talk about persuasion, but at the end of the day, there's an action that occurs, right? So what action occurs after someone sees that post? Did they click on a link, right? Did they follow another uh, channel or whatever it is? And if you do not have that influence over your community, if you don't have that trust, right, that is, that is sort of the, uh, uh, the bedrock of all of this, at the end of the day, you will not get that action and brands will not see you as being an influencer. And this is why it's really interesting, Roger, we've seen in the influencer marketing industry, it used to all be about the number of followers. Well, now they talk more about what we call micro influencers or even nano influencers. And a micro influencer, there's a lot of different definitions, but you know, minimum 10,000 followers. And now with nano influencers, they look at people with only a thousand followers and just there's a, there's a mathematical law here, Roger, but the bigger the audience, the more broad interest they tend to have and the more broad interest that the influencer will talk about in order to better engage a broader audience. And you also have some fraud potentially of buying fake followers and fake engagement. But when you get smaller and smaller, the conversations tend to be more niche and the engagement tends to be more niche and, and uh, the engagement tends to be higher on a percentage basis when you work with someone that has actually a smaller community. And so, and, and they have more trust with their community. So th the bigger you get, it's really hard to maintain that trust as you tend to work with more businesses, uh, more collaborations, the smaller you are, the easier it is to maintain that trust. So it is something that I think every influencer has to think about. And I, I know that I, that question you posed to me, Roger, is something that a lot of marketers posed to me as well can't people see through the fact that they're getting paid to do this. So the really good influencers, when, they, when a brand reaches out to them, they'll see if it's a natural for them and their audience or not. And hopefully they're only pursuing those things that are natural because if it's not natural, and I am sort of a, a B2B influencer, I've had a lot of brands reach out to me for that. And you know, one you know, fine clothing company reached out to me because all of my social media profiles, I'm wearing a, a suit jacket and a nice dress here. And they wanted to offer me a free suit, you know, and will you post this on Instagram? And I don't, I'm not, I don't talk about fashion in social media. It would be really weird to my community if I showed up promoting a, a suit company. So obviously that's not something I, I would collaborate on. It's, it's not in line with your brand. Exactly. And, and every influencer has to have this sort of meter that says this is an alignment, this is not an alignment. And if they're not doing that, then they're making a critical mistake and they lose the trust. Because if I would have talked off brand, then it becomes really, really glaringly apparent that this is just for the money. And that is the key thing here. Right. We, we should make clear that you were wearing a suit when we started, but before we started, uh, the camera's rolling. I made you change into a t-shirt. That's I am. Yes, I am in my, in, in my uh, Cal t-shirt here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is there like a, a ratio perhaps of sponsored or paid content to other content that helps build that credibility? In other words, if somebody, every post is sponsored by a brand, is that person way less credible than somebody who mostly posts unsponsored stuff and then occasionally slips one in? Yeah, I believe so. And it's really interesting. There are tools in the influencer marketing industry that will say that will basically compare the performance of your ad or things that use like hashtag ad or hashtag sponsored with your organic content. And I've been flagged because I don't post enough hashtag ad content that maybe brands don't want to work with me. And and it's it's weird that that in some ways uh, the brands want to work with influencers that have a track record, right? That are being uh, that are collaborating with other brands, but on the downside of that is absolutely Roger. There has to be a ratio. If every post was sponsored by a different brand, it really raises a lot of questions of trust that you brought up. So I think we're seeing a lot of success, and this is something that I talk about in the book as well, of more of a brand ambassador, brand advocacy approach, a long-term approach, where maybe you're just sponsored by one brand similar to how podcasts are sponsored by brands. And, and with every beginning of a podcast, you mention that brand, right? That, that is aligned. But when you talk about a different brand with every post, it just, it, it, it does create this potential Pandora's box of issues in, in terms of trust and, and credibility, what have you. So if I was an influencer, I would be really, you know, worried. I'd really want to maintain that relationship. And I think this is where it comes down to, at the end of the day, influencers or content creators, they have a passion about something and they began, they should have begun 100% organic content. Assuming that they are that passionate individual that began this journey, 
they still have that passion. They should still want to create a lot of organic content naturally because it is who they are. So if they suddenly, you know, become someone that doesn't publish any more organic content, and generally speaking, the organic content will perform better than sponsored content on, on, on average, right? Um, they're going to lose, obviously, their, their followers because there's a lot of influencers out there. When, when we include, you know, micro influencers and nano influencers, just the volume of people that you might consider to be an influencer now jumps from zero one percent of any social network to maybe one percent or two percent or three percent. So they have competition now, and over time they may lose that influence to others. And when they lose that influence, they lose the credibility, the trust, not only with their community but with the brands that they hope to work with. Now, so you know. I know that there are a ton of influencers in the beauty space and fashion and so on. That's where a lot of you know, people think of influence, Instagram influencers, and that's the first thing that comes to mind. But I know in your book, you've got some examples. What are, what are some examples of brands that don't fit that mold, either smaller companies or more industrial companies? What uh, you know, places that you would not think of as naturals for influence marketing? Yeah, so it, it's funny. I guess in, in the, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it industry by industry. So B2C space. And I also, I, I speak Japanese and Chinese and I do, I, I'm glad you have an international audience because I, before the lockdown, I traveled a lot internationally and what have you. And I'll never forget presenting in Japan to a group of small business owners. And in Japan, for those of you that may not know, they're very, very far behind in terms of social media marketing and digital marketing in general, which is actually surprising to a lot of people. On the other hand, you have countries like China or in, in Southeast Asia that are very advanced, especially in influencer marketing. But when I talk to these small business owners, overwhelming majority did not even have a social media presence. And I asked them, well, how did you grow your business? And the, the ultimate answer from everybody was word of mouth marketing. And when they saw that they didn't even have to have a social media presence if people talked about them, that they could incite word of mouth just by leveraging other people, they, they immediately saw the light and immediately started to build influencer marketing programs. And I've done business with some Chinese brands who do very little organic social media, but they have a ton of budget in influencer marketing. It's, it's sort of the same concept. So if you are a B2C brand, I mean, if you're in fashion and beauty, great. But at the end of the day, if people are not talking about your product in social, you miss out on an opportunity. And the only way to get people to talk about your product in social is to actually seed the market with your product. And we see a lot of this happening. A lot of startup small businesses are giving away product in hopes that people that have influence in social media will talk about them. And many people at this micro or nano influencer level, they will because they, they wanna serve their community. They wanna find out about the next greatest product or service. Uh, so this is really universal, even B2B of, you know, tools companies reaching out to me, Neil, we'd love it if you could try our new marketing tool. We'll give you lifetime access. We'd love to get your feedback. And if you like it, you know, if you could write a blog post, great. If not, we'd like to keep in touch. That's a great way. So just giving free product without even giving any money is a universal thing that regardless of industry, you should use. Um, I'll give you another example. The B2C, I think, is, is very easy to understand. Um, I, I'll never forget about two years ago, Roger, I presented in front of one of the big five pharmaceutical companies, and there were 50 brand managers in the room. And I went through the whole scope of you know, what you can do in digital and social media marketing. And the one thing that really caught their interest was influencer marketing. And they realized that who, who influences your community? They realized that it was the nonprofits that influence the communities that they're trying to reach with their pharmaceuticals. So by collaborating with nonprofits as influencers, they can then reach their objective. And this began a new launch for them. So you know, influencers are sometimes people, sometimes they're other entities. Well, Neil, Neil, dig into that a little bit. What, what did that look like? How did these you know, pharmaceutical companies work with uh, nonprofits as influencers? I think that they've a lot of, and, and as I was doing research before I presented to this pharmaceutical brand, there already is a lot of offline partnerships between pharmaceuticals and nonprofits. I think that it's, it's taking it online, right? It is in terms of, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of regulatory issues regarding pharmaceutical brands and, and what they can and can't do on, on social media and digital media, um, but it could just be sponsoring community conversations. 
uh, it could be having their members contribute to a blog uh, for uh, you know patient or or doctor education on the issue. There are there are a lot of potential things. They were at the very very beginning. Uh, I was really there to to present to them various ideas that they're then going to go and implement. I don't know how they ended up implementing, but if you think about it, if nonprofits are influencing th those people, and I do know that uh, one of my friends actually has a nonprofit in the diabetes space, and they 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 definitely have a B two C sort of fundraiser uh, aspect where they work with people, but they have also a B two B aspect where they work with pharmaceuticals in terms of case studies and acquiring data. Um, from from obviously the, the the people that they serve, so there's a lot of different avenues in which the collaboration can take place. It could be very uh, you know upfront in social or in digital media. It could also be in the background, or it could just be like I said, sponsoring an event. And now those events are going to be virtual, sponsoring an online community or what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another example that uh, you had in the book was the giant shipping company Maersk, uh, and they're the last company that I would think of as having a social media presence because basically the only place you see these names, the name is on giant container ships and on these containers that you see stacked up in shipyards around the world. Uh, but, you know, probably the sort of uh, least social type of business you can possibly imagine. But, but what did they do that earned them actually some acclaim? Yeah, so I think that they were very early on in this. And when I talk about these trends, that have made it very, very difficult for brands to compete in organic social media. One of the biggest trends is visual social media, right? So we have the emergence of Instagram, of Pinterest, of Snapchat, of TikTok. These are purely visual entities. So if your brand has never been able to visually represent yourself as most B2B brands, now we get to the B2B side, uh, how do you visually represent yourself? And I have actually consulted with companies where their advertising department was in charge of making visuals for Instagram. So you can imagine that every Instagram organic post literally looked like an advertisement, right? So when you scroll through your Instagram feed, you can almost see which posts are done by brands and which are done by people. And influencers have become influential because their content is aligned with people, not, not with businesses. So this is a very, very challenging thing still today for business. How do we visually represent ourselves? And what Maersk realized was they never had a visual brand, but their containers were everywhere. And a lot of people, just like you and me, we, even though we're not in the industry, we know their containers. So they began to, you know, when we get outside of just the, the visual container, we have the ships that carry the containers. We have the, the ports of call where all these containers go. We have, after they arrive there, we have the trucks that carry uh, those containers anywhere in the world. So you begin to have a type of visual storytelling based around your core product, but you know how it evolves once people start to use it. But what they did, which was really brilliant, which a lot of companies have replicated, is you know basically on more and more on social media platforms when it comes to visual content, they're not going to publish their own content. They are purely publishing what we call UGC or user-generated content. They're looking for people that are talking about Maersk and with permission, they're republishing their content. So if you were to hashtag Maersk or you can use visual uh, recognition tools that, that, that Amazon and what have you uh, have available for marketers to if, you know, look for your logo uh, anywhere on Instagram, uh, ask for permission and republish that post. So we have iconic brands like Ritz Carlton Hotels, Disneyland, that do not publish their own content on Instagram. They purely use other people's content. And this is really the ultimate because then you don't have to create your own content, right? Let what other people say about you be your social proof, your credibility. And in the art and act of doing that, you're building a deeper relationship with this person. And by the way, if we have 10 different people talking about us, why don't we pick the one that we feel is most influential? And now we have a way to begin a relationship with an influencer by saying, thank you so much for posting this picture of our company, or you came to our events, or whatever it might be for, for B2B, um, can we republish this on our account? And most people are thrilled because we've come up, you know, those of us have grown up where brands wanna be, they wanna have distance with people. Um, and I think now more and more younger generations, they want brands that, that relate to who they are. Uh, they want a brand to be part of their life. And brands are realizing that they actually want to minimize that distance. They want to become one with, with consumers and users. And this is a great way to do that. But, you know, uh, above and beyond, Roger, that this visual aspect, 
for other B2B brands where Maersk is a case where you could make it visual, there are a lot of other B2B brands where you can't. And this is where we see the role of collaborating with influencers over content. And in this case, it's not visual content, it's blog posts, right? It might be interviews, it might be podcasts, it might be videos, it might be webinars, it might be eBooks, white papers, events, any content marketing initiative. And I believe that B2B marketing, the stats that I see from my friend Joe Polizzi at, at the Content Marketing Institute, that marketing spend for B2B brands, 30, 40% sometimes is, is based on content by bringing in influencers into your content, inviting them to your events. And there's a case study in the book about the Adobe Summit and just the amount of tweets generated by the influencers that attended that event was worth millions of dollars in, in advertising spend. It becomes very, very content centric. And it's something that I think a lot of B2B brands have been doing, inviting influencers to their events to speak, to host panels, to do webinars, to interview them. So once you see it in this light, you begin to be a little bit more strategic about it. And I think with COVID-19, we see more of this actually, because uh, B2B companies need events for lead generation and they, they can't do physical events right now. They're doing more and more online and they're doing more and more with influencers. So hopefully that, that's where the concept is the same. The social network, the content medium is different. You know, I worked, I collaborated with FedEx recently for a small business contest and I posted on LinkedIn, right? That's where their audience is. That's who they want to influence. And for another brand, it might be Instagram. Uh, and even a B2B brand might pick Instagram for whatever reason, but it, it's regardless of social network and it's regardless of content medium. The principle, right, similar to this concept of influence, the principle of digital influence knows no boundary. Uh, and once you understand that concept, you, you begin to believe, as I believe, that it, it should be a line item on any marketing budget. If you have an organic social media presence, you should also be investing in relationships and collaborations with other social media users and then we finally get out of, Raj, I don't know if you see this, I see a lot of brands that still think of social media as a one-way advertising channel. We get out of that loop and begin to see social media as a way to collaborate, as a way to humanize our brand and truly collaborate with others. It becomes a big user focus group. And now we have our own team, we have our own army of influencers that become that user focus group that are our ears to the community um, that we're collaborating with, not just on amplifying our content, but helping us create content giving us feedback and really becoming a, a more and more valuable extension of the brand digitally. Yeah, one thing I want to sort of re-emphasize from that lengthy discussion was the importance of sharing your customers' content. You know, a lot of brands simply don't do that. I, I love to pick on United Airlines for a variety of reasons because I, when we were traveling, used them a lot, uh, 100,000 miles a year typically. And uh, so I, I tend to point out some of their flaws. And, but on social media, I will fairly often tweet at them if I'm traveling and have either a very good or very bad experience. Uh, and the good ones are actually quite, uh, you know, they, they will always reply. It used to be, it was like tweeting into a black hole, but now they've gotten much more savvy in that respect. Now they do respond and either take it to a, a private conversation if it's a problem or thank me for the feedback publicly or something. But, uh, you know, what if I said something really nice about them and they retweeted me to their audience? Now, they couldn't do a thousand of these a day. That would be really annoying. But, uh, you know, I think that a very small percentage of those kinds of things would make those customers feel good and uh, would cement the relationship, as you say, with somebody who may have a large following of their own. So I, th I think there's a lot of benefits there. And I think it's not that uh, a brand doesn't want to do that necessarily, just they don't think about it. They think, well, this, this is our channel, so we've got to create all the content on it. Instead of saying, well, when are our customers saying things or doing things that might be interesting to share? And you know, I've, one of the examples I tend to throw out uh, for a really boring type of product, and I apologize to industrial shelving manufacturers, but uh, you know, like, what are you going to do with industrial shelving? But, you know, when you think about it, I bet some customers are doing some pretty interesting things with industrial shelving. You know, they're, they're putting live animals on them or something, you know, and uh, that would probably make a great visual for something. You, what you don't want to do is have the advertising department, you know, create a bunch of different angles uh, on industrial shelves. <laughs> that would be boring after about the second one. But, yeah, you know, yeah, what, what are funny. your customers doing? Yeah, we, we talk about in marketing more and more, we talk about CX, customer experience, right? But 
marketers, especially in social and on websites, what have you, they're really good about talking about product. They're not good about talking about that experience because they themselves are not experienced and only your customers are. So when you, you know, reset your mindset and you understand that customer experience, like that industrial shelf that might have animals on it or those unique use case, you know, experiences. And the fact that people are sharing more and more of these on social media, to me, it's a natural formula for, for significantly improving um, everything you do digitally by leveraging the voice of the customer and all the, you know, the fringe benefits that come with doing that. Uh, but it requires a different mindset. And I found when I wrote my book as well, the first part is just trying to reset that mindset of just looking at things extremely holistically. You know, where are we? We're, we're in the second decade of social media marketing now. These are not new platforms. Are we still doing things that we did 10 years ago when the market of today is just, and, and the consumer today is just completely different? Um, so hopefully, you know, that book and, and this conversation is, is a wake up call to, to some that may not have realized that that are listening. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one sort of last topic I want to cover, and uh, I want to turn it around from the standpoint of becoming an influencer. We talked about Mark Schaefer, uh, your fellow uh, Rutgers teacher, and your not quite namesake, almost namesake, unrelated. Uh, he wrote a book called Known, and it was about how to become known in a particular space as an expert. Uh, I'm curious and there's a lot of good advice in that book. What about the, any of our audience members who want to become an influencer themselves? Maybe they have a passion about something, whether it's a hobby, whether, you know, maybe it's related directly to their primary work. Maybe they, they love industrial shelving or something, or maybe it's something else, uh, digital cameras, you know, but how does one go about uh, achieving that even micro or nano influence? I guess nano influencer would be a good place to start. How, how do you get to that point? Right. So it's interesting because one of the trigger points for me writing the book was speaking at a marketing class for MBA students at USC a few years ago. And up until that time, I've been getting some questions about influencer marketing once I finished my speech. But on that day, I got as many questions about not just influencer marketing from a, a marketing perspective, but how do I become an influencer? And that's when I realized that there's any marketer listening. I think that the biggest Instagram account in Japan is run by a marketer who saw the power of, of Instagram influence and decided to create an account for their dog which now is like the number one account. And he's using all the marketing techniques he's used for, for, for his company to, uh, to leverage that account. So I think it's natural that marketers would want to become more influential. It's actually one of the, the final chapters in the book. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that the more, you know, getting back to a lot of the concepts in, in the original book on influence of, of social proof and authority, that the more influential your business accounts are in social media, the easier it becomes for you to actually collaborate with influencers and it actually becomes more advantageous of a relationship when, when you build more influence. So extending off of that, obviously, you know, building influence, if you were to reverse engineer, right, all of the advice for marketers and reverse engineer, what do brands look for when they work with people? Um, it comes down to, first of all, content creation. And it comes down to, a, in, in marketing, uh, we often refer this as to a niche. I don't necessarily think you have to have an extremely narrow niche, but the more focused you are on a topic and the more consistent you are of talking about that topic, just the way that the algorithms work, um, and some work better than others in terms of, I want to find people talking about such and such. I'll do a hashtag search on Instagram. I'll do a Twitter search. I'll do a LinkedIn search. Over time, we begin to find people that we're interested in and we begin to follow them and we get to see more and more of their content. So definitely it's, it's a combination of, of content creation, of consistency, of really sticking to a, a certain niche. And I do believe as part of that, and we see a lot of this in podcasting of, of people that I've never heard of that reach out to me that want to interview me because at the end of the day, they are, they are using influencer marketing. They are assuming that if they interview me, then I'm going to share that episode with my audience, and therefore, it's going to attract new listeners to their podcast. So you'll have a lot of up-and-coming nano-influencers or, or content creators want to collaborate with people that are bigger than them that are attracting the same audience. This is influencer marketing, right, of trying to find others that you can collaborate with, whether it's a, you know in, in terms of a blog or an Instagram shout-out. There's a lot of different ways. So I think that 
a lot of influencers, when they work their way up what I would call this influencer pyramid of sorts, uh, that collaboration with other influencers in their industry or perhaps in related industries is another important aspect of really uh, uh, of yielding a big old, bigger digital footprint. But after that, like I said, it, it, it does come down to consistency. It comes down to engaging your community, uh, of reaching out to others that might be interested in what you have to say. It, it could be blog comments. It could be podcast reviews. It could be you know retweets. There's a lot of different ways of doing this. But it, it requires time. It requires somewhat subject matter expertise or experience. And it requires passion because this does not happen overnight. And it has to be something you want to be committed to for the next few years. So if it's something that you do for a living like I do, or like you do, Raj, it is a natural that we will podcast every week because there's so much we want to talk about, whether or not we have a guest or not. And that is the same mentality you need to have because you need to be checking in as you build a community, you need to be checking in on them. You need to be helping them. And if you don't have passion for something, it's just not going to last. So that would be my advice for, for those that well, are. That's it reminds me of for years, I was in the community building space, online communities, and you would find people who wanted to start a community because they felt a particular area was hot, you know, it was going to be a good marketing vehicle for them. And like after two months, it's, oh, this is not working at all. You know, we've got so few members, I, this, you know, this isn't good. It's, well, it's, it's not working because it doesn't happen that quickly. You know, this has got to be, you really have to play the long game. I'm sure there are some people who hit it instantly for whatever reason, but but by and large, I think it is a long game that you've got to create that body of work and show that you're really passionate about it. If you are even, uh, if you're bringing a commercial mentality to it, it's probably not going to work. But anyway, Neil, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, why don't Roger, you... um, I just wanted to add on to that. Oh, Sorry, sure, sure. Not go ahead. You, but it comes down to no like, and trust. And just because we live in a digital world doesn't mean that it, it's going to be any quicker to develop a relationship with someone and truly know, like, and trust them. That takes time to develop relationships, whether it's offline or online. And that's the key thing that people need to remember. Well said. Uh, so Neil, how can people find you and your ideas online? Well, my, uh, I, I am Neil Schaefer, N-E-A-L, the real Neil, S-C-H-F-F-E-R. Uh, so I am that handle uh, everywhere on social media. I have a website where I blog. Uh, neilshafer.com. I also have a podcast, which is called the Maximize Your Social Influence podcast, if you're interested in what we've been discussing. Uh, and my new book, The Age of Influence, is available everywhere fine books are sold, offline and online. Awesome. Well, we will link to those places and any other resources we talked about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. Neil, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much, Roger.